more of a spiritual backbone will establish itself again in the church. Because we can only read how they stood. And they didn't compromise. Jeremiah knew his life could be taken. Uh, Isaiah knew uh, these men suffered. They were punished. But they, they gave out warnings against uh, Babylon, against Assyria, against these nations that took captive uh, this uh, precious treasure of God, Israel. And then they warned Israel. They didn't spare Israel. They didn't spare Judah, Benjamin, the ten tribes. They, they, they pointed out their corruption. They pointed out the corruption of their priesthood and their, their prophets. And uh, I think we, the church is going to have to uh, somehow wean itself from wanting to hear good words all the time. Words of praise, words of, of um, always you're, you're, you're well, and there's nothing wrong. Uh, we're going to have to come between now and the coming of Jesus. We must, as I talked to the church last night, for these great events, the restoring of Israel, getting ready for the first resurrection, the time of the seven trumpets, the seven vows, the seven judgments, the period of silence is to come by the prophecy of Revelation. We, we must get a spiritual backbone and we must somehow accept the fact that even in the worst of time of the judgment of God as it was with Israel and was with these 12 tribes, there is a remnant as there was then. There is a remnant, and that remnant must stand uncompromisingly for the written word. Uh, that we, somehow the church must get that back again into their heart and uh, not, not be as they are in the attitude they have now that you're going to offend me, you're going to hurt me, you're going to bother me. If you say that, I won't like it. If you say that, you'll discourage me. If you say that, you'll push me back. But somehow, we must establish a hunger again for the written word. Yes. And we'll see that as we go through these prophets. Yes. We'll see that, that there was a remnant. And they established that desire. They did not, even though they were in captivity. That's why Daniel, we have the book of Daniel. That was written entirely in captivity. And Daniel proved that he could stand and not eat the king's meat. They said, he'll, he'll do away with you, Daniel. And there's a fiery furnace for you. And for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you're going in that, you're going to perish. Daniel said, well, you judge ye whether it's right to serve Nebuchadnezzar, to serve God. And uh, you do what you will, we will not eat the king's meat. And they didn't. And he gave, they gave him a, a trial in the book of Daniel. Um, and Daniel said, you put us on the, on the um, diet of uh, vegetables. Uh, what really they ate was a type of bean and bean soup, uh, lentil soup. Uh, for a period of days. And he said, now you let them eat the king's meat, the Babylonians, and then compare at the end of so many days, which one of us looks better? Which one of us looks more healthy? Has a better complexion? And at the end of so many days, they compared, and it was a great testimony that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked better, was in better health because they didn't eat the king's meat. Yes. Well, I think the church is going to have to make some decisions about uh -huh. eating some of the king's meat and eat the written word. Yes. The written word. Because in the end, it will establish us. Oh, yes. 
Yes. It will make us healthy. Uh -huh. We'll escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. We'll escape that because we're partakers of his divine nature. And uh, so it's a real, it's a real, uh, uh, look, look at the verse there. At the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fair and fatter in flesh. I imagine they were pink in their cheeks and they were rosy cheeks. You know, looks so good, and uh, that all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. That's how God can fight for his people. If we eat the right thing, that's the written word of God. Yes. And we refrain from the flesh thing of meat, the portion of flesh. Meat is flesh. We abstain from the fleshly works and not consume that, eat that. I believe we'll be in better health, spiritually, <coughs> naturally, spiritually, naturally. Yeah. I believe that we'll be in better health, spiritually and naturally. So as we go into Isaiah, I gave you a background and of uh, these uh, prophets that when they wrote, and uh, you can see much of their word that they, uh, they have to give us uh, why then they could they could do that, and, and much of what he said. <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to try to push this out so it'll be as interesting as can be, and uh, we'll read some here in the book of Isaiah, chapter one. And we're going to when I come to a portion of the chapter that's dealing with non-essentials of our intent to understand prophecy and the way the prophets were speaking to Judah, Benjamin, and to the ten tribes um, and to Babylon, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll, we're just going by that. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to go right through the book of Isaiah. It'll take us some time, but I believe that we'll be blessed of God in doing it. And if we don't feel the Spirit of God in it, then at some point we can break it off. Uh, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That was the span that his prophecy was covering, was the, was the reign of these kings. Uh, <coughs> He said that there, these, these kings now, in the days of, his, uh, of Uzziah, that's one, Jotham is two, Ahaz is three, Hezekiah. Four kings and their time of ruling. And his words are dealing with the corruption and the sin and the prophecies that were in these, uh, this reign of four kings. And uh, he goes on, verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Now this phrase is used many times through Jeremiah and Isaiah in particular. The heaven he's referring to is simply referring to the sacrifice, the altar, and the temple at, uh, in Jerusalem uh, that they worshiped him and where they felt that they were contacting Jehovah God of heaven. Uh, and to the Israelite, heaven was a place where God's throne was. Uh, they, they, they believed that. It was, um, they did not strangely to say, I might make this remark, the Israelites did not believe in a resurrection as a whole nation. They believed when the soul died, it died. And only the spirit was retained by God, Jehovah God, in a place called paradise or a place called heaven. But elements in um, Israel in, did not even believe that. The Pharisees, the largest religious sect, in Israel, 
they believed in resurrection. The Sadducees, which was equally a large portion of the priesthood, did not believe in resurrection. So there was only a portion of Israel that believed in resurrection. Um, they all believed the soul died. It did not have life after the flesh life ended. There was only a remnant that believed that they would come forth in the resurrection when Christ came. And that was Abraham and the list of those are in um, Hebrews 11. They believed that they would come forth when Christ came forth, their Messiah. They were only a very small group. The nation did not believe that as a whole. Only that remnant believed that. Now, what value is this? And I'll get Sister Ella here. Remember, nowhere in the annals or history or the chronology of God's word do we have everyone accepting or believing or practicing God's word. It's just as useless to believe everyone ever will or everyone will be saved or everyone will have vision. It's a, it's a wasted, wasted hope. It's not God's will that any should perish, but millions will perish. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And many have perished. Yes. It's not God's will. Well, whose will is it? It's the individual will. Amen. It's not God's will. It's the individual will. Amen. See, that, that they perish. All right, Sister Ellen. Um, so it goes to show that uh, biblical Israel was a much divided faith and people. Yes. And perhaps it was God's intention that Christ should come at that time to unite them under one thinking. One he really thinking. came unto his own, one which was Israel. Christ came. He came unto his own as a Messiah, but they rejected him as a nation because they could not see, they could not believe due to the fact that they had rejected the written word for hundreds of years and they were divided and they were sold into slavery and their nation was torn down and desecrated because of their unbelief. God even divorced them. God divorced the nation of Israel. Gave them a divorce. Separated himself from them. Gave them up to vile affections. Are they still, you know, still divided today? They're still divided, but God is going to do a quick work and once again cut it short in righteousness. He's going to come in to the second advent of Christ, as I ministered last night, and just before his coming, it, there's going to be a 144,000 of the Israelites saved and believe in their Messiah. Now that will constitute the believing nation that will come back to God as the remnant that followed Christ 2,000 years ago constituted the believing element of Israel that received him. He came into his own, which was collectively the nation of Israel, but his own received him not. Collectively, they did not receive him. So just like the Christians, there, there can be one focus, one God, one Christ, but everybody wants a different route to get to him. Exactly. No less, no different today. Uh, we are the, uh, the church is the spiritual Israel, and they parallel it in every way. They parallel it in every way. The, 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 the spiritual Israel today parallels the corruptible Israel that we're going to study in these prophets uh, to the letter, to the T, uh, to the spirit. Uh, they practice... They, they preach, but they do not practice. They say, but they do not. 
uh, see, th this, this is again. But my hope, my joy, and my peace is in the understanding I have of the written word, not the spoken word. I've heard the spoken word, and I accept the spoken word from any leader, from any teacher, from any child of God, if it matches the written word. Amen. If it harmonizes with the written word. Amen. Amen. But if it's a spoken word that does not harmonize with the written word, right. I can't accept it. That's it. Because I'll make the same mistake right. as they made in Israel. Yeah. I'll make the same mistake. But here in uh, the, the uh, book of Isaiah, he said, Hear, O heavens, that is the hierarchy of the priesthood, and give ear, O earth. That was, the, that was the tribes of Israel, the earth. Jeremiah used the phrase in the book of Jeremiah, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. See, he was speaking to the elements of Israel and that they would hear the word of the Lord, O earth. Um, that, that we are the earth, so that we, we are to hear. Um, I have nourished and brought up children, and this is God, and they have rebelled against me. He nourished and brought up generations of Israelites, children. God nourished and brought up uh, nations, that is, uh, generations of the seed of Israel, starting with the miraculous <coughs> birth of Isaac to Abraham, to fulfill the promise he made to Abraham. Mm -hmm. Child of promise, not a child by nature. Isaac was a child of promise. Isaac would have never been if God had not made the promise in Exodus the 12th chapter and the first verse. To Abraham, get thee out of the country, and from thy country, and from thy land, and go to the land that I will give thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. If that promise had not been made, Isaac would have never been born, because the womb of Sarah was barren, and could not bear, just like Hannah's womb was bare, and could not bear, and could not bear a uh, seed. But God intervened and let seed be in the womb of Sarah, the womb of Hannah, the womb of Mary, the virgin. Amen. This was the predestinated will of God for seed to give life in those wombs uh, so that he could bring forth his generation of the righteous of God. That's why God does those things, to bring forth the righteousness of, of his word. Yes. He didn't have to let uh, Samuel be born, but if he had not let Samuel be born, then uh, there would have been no righteousness in the land. And it would have meant Eli and his sons mm -hmm. were corrupt. Yeah. The priesthood was corrupt. So God had to give a barren woman a son that he could raise up the law. Yes. And he would be a lawgiver. Is Abraham's seed the right thinking of the Jewish people unto God? Are they the example the Jews are to follow? That well, way of thinking, a, the Abraham's seed uh, today is not the general collection of people that populate Palestine nor Israel. That's a mixed seed. But in that mixed seed, God is going to save 144,000 and then from that seed he will once again bring about a righteous nation and a righteous nations in not only the seed of Isaac but the seed of Ishmael and he will save, regenerate his nations that have uh, that contact with the house of Abraham in the Middle East. And that will become the nations, some of the nations that are saved. Because remember, 
uh, even though they're now at war and have been for generations, the seed of Ishmael and the seed of Isaac, but they are kin to one another. They're both sons of Abraham. Abraham is their father. Abraham, the faith of Abraham, is what both of them will eventually come back to. And the faith of Abraham was that he, in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, saw a city. <clears throat> and it, he, he didn't have a continuing city here. He was a nomad. But he saw a city. He looked for a city which had foundations, <clears throat> whose builder and maker was God. Uh, so uh, this seed now that uh, Abraham uh, propagated, and by faith, he knew that there was to be another city, and by faith, he looked forward to being a part of that, and his seed, and his seed is the stars which are in the sky. So God's word is that of a continuing development of his overall eternal purpose. God's eternal purpose is always in the temporary and the contemporary conditions he leads his people through. God's eternal purpose. Everything I'm going through now is for his eternal purpose. The church now is in the state it's in for his eternal purpose. It's a contemporary state. It's a temporary state from the church to the kingdom, but it is, it is for the eternal purpose of God. So I'm to give heed as the earth to hear the word of the Lord. I'm to give heed as part of the heavens to hear the word of the Lord as he said to Israel. The 144,000 are the Jewish people of Israel only. Israel, that's Israel. See, the 12 Where tribes Israel are seen. In, in Israel of today, where the Muslims and the Arabs and the Israel? That, that's, God is not looking at that as Israel. Okay. We're talking about Israel, Jewish mm -hmm. people. The seed, the Jewish seed. That now he will save other nations besides Israel. But he specifically shows us that he's going to save 144,000 out of the 12 tribes. But he will save others. Other nations will be saved. Remnants of other nations. So God is no respect for persons. He does not intend to destroy one seed and then let another seed live. Every seed has to become righteous in God as a new earth and a new heaven. There will be seeds obliterated and wiped out of the earth, but God will save a remnant seed out of every nation that God has predestinated for them to be saved and for them to live and not die. Mm -hmm. And the book of Revelation said, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of the holy city. So there's to be nations saved, a remnant of those nations, just like a remnant of Israel. Now, he goes on and he said in verse three, uh, well, he said, I have nourished and brought up, verse two, the children, and they have rebelled against me, speaking of Israel. The ox knoweth his owner, and the, ax, uh, the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, 